U.S. goes to war against the Caribbean island of Grenada. Their mission, stop a Cuban-inspired coup and rescue stranded American students. We were just hoping that someone would come get us. But the operation is a logistical nightmare, and troops face a determined enemy. It's time to die. Can U.S. forces win in this Cold War confrontation? Next. October 25th, 1983, 5.30 a.m. In the skies over the Eastern Caribbean, several hundred Army Rangers, like Sergeant Bruce McGraw, are packed into transport planes. We couldn't even sit down with our equipment and then all the other troops kind of piled in. It was one of the most packed aircraft I'd ever been in. So we sat on a trash can back to back for eight hours on that flight. The mission jump directly into what is now enemy territory, Point Salinas International Airport. Ranger Steve Trujillo is a senior medic in one of those planes. He is shown in shadow because of his current job. Rangers operate at night, okay, and we had been working at night for years. Those are environment, nighttime. For Rangers, speed is essential. Surprise before dawn is key. But now it's already daylight. The enemy will see them if they jump. The invasion of Grenada has yet to begin. We all said, where? And it's already at risk. Seven months earlier, President Ronald Reagan had signaled his concern about a Caribbean island nation known best for its spices. Grenada, that tiny little island, it isn't nutmeg that's at stake in the Caribbean and Central America. It is the United States' national security. A military coup raises the threat of a second Cuba in this strategic area. President Reagan orders American troops to war for the first time since Vietnam. It's a rescue mission with two primary goals. It begins with rangers parachuting onto the Point Salinas airfield to secure the airport adjacent to St. George's University. Rangers will then rescue hundreds of American students trapped at the school. At the same time, another group, Delta Force Commandos in Black Hawk helicopters, will go to Richmond Hill Prison and attempt to free political prisoners there. Prior to the coup, no one at the school could have imagined needing to be rescued by U.S. Rangers. The students had always gotten along well with the Cubans on the island. We tried to keep out of the political realm. They played softball uh, with our students on a regular basis, so the, the, there was a lot of fraternization and uh, uh, the, there were no problems that we knew of between the, uh, the Cubans, whether they were workers or military people, and, and the students. But now, the coup is making the student situation unstable and dangerous. A curfew was instituted, which was actually announced on the radio as a shoot-to-kill curfew. We had very, very limited food. We ran out of water within 24 hours. And we didn't even have water to wash ourselves or, or to go to the bathroom. I think that is probably the time when most of us started realizing that Something major is going on in the country, and we want to leave. Days gone by, we became more and more worried about what was going to happen to us. Um, the head of the coup and several of his soldiers came to our campus one day to try to calm us down. However, it had the exactly opposite effect on us.
as the Rangers on the transport planes prepare to parachute into battle to rescue the students. The Black Hawk helicopters, loaded with Delta Force commandos, are also approaching the island to rescue the prisoners at Richmond Prison. 28-year-old Paul Price is one of the mission's younger pilots. Absolutely exciting. I mean, I trained and trained and we trained. We had older pilots that were Vietnam era, and then you had the young bucks like myself ready to go, and they're saying, you'll see what it's really like. The Blackhawks break formation to head to their objectives. They have unique capabilities, especially when it's dark. But the mission is delayed several times so that the combined forces can all arrive at the same time at daybreak. Well, our first indication things weren't going really correct was uh, it's daylight. So now here we are coming to Grenada and the sun's up. You can't hide. And there's more bad news. The uh, radio station there was broadcasting um, repel the Americans as they come in. The critical element of surprise has been lost. The mission is barely underway and it's already in jeopardy. The Rangers, waiting to parachute in and capture the airport, receive the news. The mission has been compromised. I'm sitting right next to a radio operator. So I'm hearing all this horrific message traffic. The Cubans know we're coming. Um, they're erecting obstacles on the runway. Little details that, as a 23-year-old cherry, you don't want to be hearing. I'm just getting a really sinking feeling because, you know, when we jump in in daylight, we've lost, you know, the cover of darkness. Steve used to say, whatever sucks the most is what we're going to do. And that's pretty much the way it was. Then, things get worse for Paul Price and his Black Hawk crew, en route to Richmond Hill Prison. We started taking fire as we approached our objective. We saw it and we heard it um, from both sides, left and right side. At that point, uh, just uh, decided to kind of regroup and go around and come back in and try it again. Pilot Keith Lucas makes a second approach. I'm doing navigation and telling him which way I need to go to get the airplane into the position. There's nowhere to set the helicopter. When we were uh, looking at our maps, which were basically road maps, it really didn't show terrain relief or obstacles or anything in, to that effect that you want to know as a pilot going into your landing zone. We're taking such heavy fire, at this point, uh, we take a major hit on the aircraft. The airplane shook violently. Keith was hit. I took the control and basically just dove the helicopter down into the valley to get out of the uh, out of harm's way and to recover the helicopter. Don't have too many options now. I really don't want to go in the water with all these people on board. Uh, my only option is the trees that are over to my left or try to make it over to the airport, which is not secure because the rangers haven't jumped in yet. So my option was to put it in the trees. It's a horrible option, but it's the only one they've got. Meanwhile, the rangers waiting to parachute in face their own horrible option. It was a 500-foot jump. I wasn't flying a plane, and I sure as hell didn't have an altimeter, so I just kind of like went out the door, waited till I hit the ground. We normally trained at 1,000 or 1,250. 500 was low. But the Rangers have no choice. They're under fire. I just remember like seeing that everyone's like looking around, like all of a sudden there's a beam of light coming through the plane. The Rangers have to jump. I hit so hard that uh, it shattered the crystal on my watch. 0531 was the time that stuck on there. The 
U.S. invasion of Grenada and rescue of American students stranded on the island is barely underway. But already, a Black Hawk helicopter en route has been hit by enemy fire and is reeling out of control. With the pilot severely wounded, co-pilot Paul Price manages to crash land in the trees. So I'm hanging upside down. I can't see. Uh, I reach up, pull the throttles off, get everything offline. I always carried a boot knife. So I cut myself out. I said, uh, yeah, anybody seen Keith? And at this point, it, it's starting to smoke, and we know it's going to blow any time. So we're trying to get Keith out. We just can't get him out. Black Hawk pilot Keith Lucas is dead, shot in the chest and head. He's the first casualty of the operation. He was 26 years old. The survivors move up the mountain to high ground and are eventually rescued. But as far as they're concerned, Operation Urgent Fury is already going terribly wrong. The Cuban and Grenadian forces know they're coming. And a pilot is dead. You're trained to, uh, uh, to accept these changes that happen and to go with the flow to complete the mission. By 7 a.m., some 1,200 U.S. Rangers are now parachuting into Grenada's airport. But they're under fire. Enemy troops are positioned in the hills next to the runway, where the rangers struggle to organize. Nearby, the medical students hear the gunfire. But at this point, it only increases their fear. That is one of those moments I will remember for the rest of my life. You were in your bed, sleeping, awoken by gunfire. And you just did not know at that moment what was occurring. Meanwhile, it's sheer chaos for the rangers who've just landed. The Cubans had driven trucks out onto the runway, and, and they had uh, pounded spikes into the tarmac, barrels, and concertina wire, barbed wire, logs. They did not want anyone to, to, to land aircraft onto the runway. We were on the south side of the runway, and we moved north uh, to clear the control tower area. And uh, that was when we, I saw our first casualty. This was the first dead American soldier I'd ever seen. And I look at his jungle boots, and his jungle boots look just like mine. And that just really struck me doesn't get any more real than that. Most of the rangers land where they're supposed to, on the north side of the runway. This allows them access to St. George's University Medical School, known as True Blue, where the medical students are stranded. But one group of rangers comes down on the other side of the airstrip, near the ocean, and next to some giant boulders. No one could do the mission stuck between rocks and the ocean. Separated from the rest of the rangers, they have to get to the other side of the runway. Dodging enemy fire, they pick their way through the rocky terrain. When I say these rocks, they're bold as, you know, the size of Volkswagens. And it won't get any easier when they arrive at the runway, where the rangers will be wide open to enemy fire. Get your squad across that runway. It was very, very wide. 200 yards, 300 yards. There was a lot of fire coming down the runway. I said, there's no way 
anyone can cross this runway. The rest of the Rangers, already on the safer side of the runway, try to provide cover so the second group can cross. I had my sniper rifle. So I was able to see in the hills beyond north of the runway, and I could see people moving with, say, machine guns or whatever. I could see quite a bit further than with the naked eye. Sergeant Dale Killinger relays the information to a radio operator. The hope is that heavy artillery will be called in to take the enemy snipers out. But there's a problem. It's difficult to coordinate the enemy's exact position because no one seems to have the proper maps. We had, um, essentially it was a, 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 almost like a hand-drawn map from a handout that somebody might get in a hotel or something like that. It was not a military grid map. The runway was actually sketched onto it. But there was no relief, there was no elevation, there was no vegetation. We don't know exactly what happened. We just know that we didn't have the right maps for Grenada. The maps they do have, supplied by the Grenada Tourist Board, are five years old. It's an intelligence failure that threatens the men on the ground. At 18, I left that up to, you know, the officers and, you know, the majors and colonels. I, Always thought they knew what was right and what to do. Stuck in no man's land, the Rangers need a plan. Now. The commander has a bold idea for getting his squad across the runway. And he says there's a bulldozer down the runway. So they found someone that could hotwire a car. Oh, they can hotwire that bulldozer. I can do it. Hey, guys, going out. Fire it. He went down there, they hotwired the bulldozer. We got behind it, Captain Abazade included, you know, led the way, Call me. Sergeant Manus Bowles positions himself behind the controls. He is exposed and vulnerable. He had the um, blade of the bulldozer up as best he could, and he ducked, I guess. I mean, I was more concerned with my own ass than his. <laughs> With their shoulders brushing the giant turning treads, the Rangers make their move. I knew in a million years I wouldn't try to leave the safety of that bulldozer. You heard so much firing, bouncing off this thing. You had 400 Rangers giving you cover and fire. You had the Ranger mortars. So a lot of people were helping us to make sure these six, seven guys get across that runway. It was the longest two minutes you could, you could live. It works. The bulldozer helps reunite the Rangers. By mid-morning, the airport is secure, and U.S. planes can land. Now the Rangers turn their attention to the original mission, the rescue at the medical school. Resistance is light, and after a brief firefight with Grenadian guards, U.S. forces enter the campus. I remember uh, hearing kids are outside, it's the Americans, it's the Americans, and then at some point hearing an American soldier saying, we're American soldiers, we're going to get you out of here. Some people were very happy, some people were crying, some people were laughing. One of the things my friends and I were saying to each other, if I ever get off this damn rock, I'm going to kiss the ground and kiss the American soil. When the soldiers first came and we started talking to them, I still remember them looking at us and saying, what do you mean, ma'am? There's more students. We thought you were all the students that were there. And unfortunately, they didn't know about the other campuses. The Rangers are shocked to learn that these aren't the only students. There is another medical school campus nearby at Grand Anse with even more students. And hundreds of others are scattered around the island school officials had tried to warn the military of the situation. We had been working with the State Department and the National Security Council uh, regarding this. My only request, ironically, at the time, was that we needed to round the students up so they're at one central location. Somehow, U.S. officials in Washington had failed to relay this critical intelligence to the military. I didn't just show them maps. I'd give them maps. I'd even marked out possible helicopter landing sites for them. 
But instead of maps with landing sites, the soldiers end up with tourist maps. Another major snafu in this ill-fated mission. The Rangers need a better way to find the second campus at Grand Anse and rescue those students. But first, they have to evacuate the 138 students at the main campus. At some time in the late afternoon, they escorted us back to our rooms to collect one bag. They gave us about 10 minutes in our room. The students are ready to leave Grenada. But unforeseen obstacles will threaten both them and the troops. Day one of Operation Urgent Fury is in full swing all over the island of Grenada. But now, there are men missing on the mountain ridge overlooking Point Salinas Airport, which the Rangers have struggled to secure. We had jeeps that could get down to the far reaches of the airfield quicker than we could walk. And one of the jeeps that was, had that mission was ambushed. And no one had had contact with that jeep for a long period of time. A squad of rangers is quickly ordered into the dense and dangerous forest to find them. We get up top of the hill, and um, you know that's when you know things come start coming apart. On the way to find the jeep, there's serious trouble. The search party has run directly into the enemy in the form of three Soviet armored personnel carriers known as BTR-60s. We're gonna try to stop them. Fortunately, the Rangers are equipped with light anti-tank weapons known as LAWS. So, myself and Tim, one of my teammates, we each had a law, and as the BTRs came down in front of us, we had a good broadside shot and we each shot at the BTR. And we both missed. 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 Rangers back at the airport are alerted and have more success. They also hammer the BTRs with mortars and law rockets. Some poor soul was thrown straight up in the sky, probably 200 feet, just pinned The only thing I said when that body went in the air, I went, holy shit, look at that. I'd say poor guy, but he was shooting at us a minute earlier. All of a sudden, just hit the fan. What I mean is, there was an immediate, outrageous, hugely loud sequence of firing, and it just didn't stop. It was like... Somebody opened a can of whoop ass and started just firing. It's a huge firefight. The Rangers near the BTRs are especially vulnerable to friendly fire. Not only are the Cubans shooting at them, they're also in the line of fire from their own troops. We were on the receiving end of, of, uh, of the bad guys getting shot. So we were uh, receiving all the, the, the rounds that were getting past them. We knew that they were probably taken out, but not sure. The Rangers survive the assault, and the BTRs no longer seem to be a threat. They continue their original mission to track the missing Jeep crew, but they are uneasy. When they finally find them, four crew members have been wiped out by enemy fire. There will be no rescue. Now, the Rangers are deep in hostile territory about a mile from the airport and need to save themselves but one of the BTRs has left them a surprise you know I could see through the break in the trees I, I scanned my eyes you know just just a natural act to follow that line sight and at that moment when I saw the guy stand up and shoot Lieutenant Ferrari I heard him get hit, kind of like hitting 
a side of beef, and he dropped immediately. I thought, oh my, what are we going to do now? And that kicked off the ambush that we were in. It's about two and a half hours, that fight. What had happened was that BTR had slowed down enough to let off roughly 11 guys, and they set up that hasty ambush that we walked into. All I could see was Lieutenant laying in the road. So they, they provided covering fire. I went out, grabbed a lieutenant, pulled him back into the weeds with me, and then from there, I carried him up to where the doctor was waiting. We passed him up real quick. We'd never leave a ranger behind, and I wasn't going to leave him behind. As night falls, the Cubans and Grenadians retreat, and the rangers take stock of their first time in combat. I shot everything that I had, about 1,500 rounds that day. Day one of Operation Urgent Fury has not gone anywhere close to plan. Five Army Rangers are dead, six wounded, and the American medical students are still trapped, unable to leave the campus. The explanation? The threat from enemy snipers is too great. So we didn't really get any rest that night. It was very, very stressful, and we were freezing our asses off. This is like a baptism for you. Early on day two, the decision is finally made to lead the students to safety. With dozens of rangers providing cover, the 138 students from the True Blue campus are led outside. They are then escorted to the U.S.-controlled airport for evacuation. Despite the constant threat of enemy fire, it goes without a hitch. A few hours later, the students arrive in friendly territory. And we got off the first transport in Puerto Rico. Uh, I said to a friend of mine, take a picture of me. <laughs> I wanted one picture of me. And as I got off the plane, I kissed the ground. But there are still over 200 medical students stranded at the second campus, at Grand Anse. Even so, President Reagan declares victory in Grenada. I can't say enough in praise of our military. Army Rangers and paratroopers, Navy, Marine, and Air Force personnel, those who planned a brilliant campaign and those who carried it out. Almost instantly, our military seized the campus where most of our students were and are now in the mopping up phase. But Reagan is wrong. The war is far from over. I asked somebody, I said, what's going on with these guys? They're not surrendering. Of course they were going to resist there. Cubans. This is what they did. They fought. They deserved my respect. They earned my respect and they got it. It was all about the revolution. U.S. troops are still fighting a determined enemy. And 233 American students still need to be rescued from the Grand Anse campus. But when? And how? Two thousand miles from Grenada, in New York City, the Chancellor of St. George's University is increasingly concerned about the students the Rangers have yet to reach at the Grand Anse campus. He's getting first-hand accounts of what's happening on the island. We had set up a ham radio uh, on the Grand Anse campus, and we had set it up for any emergencies. We had always had it. When these events started unfolding, we decided to use a code system to be able to use the ham radio to talk back and forth. It's a primitive code system that uses two identical dictionaries, one with the students, the other with the chancellor, to communicate one word at a time. 159. If you wanted to say uh, parachute, if you look up the word parachute and whatever page number it was on, that would be a number. So it would be 175, that's the page number, A or B, which is the column, and one more number, how many words down? So when the students stranded at the Grand Dance campus wish to communicate the word 
parachute. The code they send over the ham radio is 175, the page number, B, the column, and 11, how many words down it appears on the page. 175. One of the student's coded messages makes the chancellor especially anxious. They were saying, Grenadian soldiers are walking by the windows waving to us. What should we do? I said, wave back, and I'm, I'm calling the State Department to try to find out more. By now, the military knows the location of the Grand Dance campus, thanks to details provided by the first group of evacuated students. But once again, Army Rangers do not have the proper maps for their field operation. The battle of Grand Dance was planned on a friend of mine surfing map. Somehow, the surfing map is good enough. Troops make their way to the Grand Dance Medical School. But it's surrounded by enemy troops. There's a lot of fire going on from the Navy, strafing around us and just out of the blue. Machine gun fire came right at me. Hit to my left about a foot, my right about a foot, right in front of me and right behind me. It didn't hit me. The students are also in the line of fire. It's a desperate situation. With bullets flying everywhere, they could be killed before the Rangers can get to them. They would put mattresses up around the windows and stuff to keep, you know, keep any fire, you know, just glass shattering or whatever from in them. But, I mean, they were strafed pretty heavily all around them. With the students in dire need of help, Every minute counts. The U.S. troops carefully launch their assault. With precision timing, they storm the building and quickly overwhelm the Grenadians. In a matter of minutes, they're inside. We maintained the position until the students were out, and I think I think it was a grand total of 27 minutes for 200 and some students. It was a phenomenal rescue. Um, it all went, I think, pretty much like clockwork. The swiftness of the Rangers is key to the operation. All 233 students at the Grand Dance campus make it out alive. But throughout the island, pockets of resistance remain. To flush them out, Army Rangers will embark on a dangerous mission that will lead to tragedy. Grenada, day three. Sporadic fighting from the insurgents continues to flare. But on the south side of the island, Intelligence reports the enemy is amassing troops. This calls for a new operation. Eight Black Hawk helicopters, each filled with 15 or so Rangers, are assigned to take them out. My platoon leader came out and briefed the aircraft commander and said, and this was the first that I had heard of this mission, we were going to conduct a combat assault in the Calvigny barracks. The Calavini barracks lie on a peninsula. Access is difficult, and hundreds of enemy troops await them. It was outrageous. It was supposed to be like, I don't know, 600 Cubans there and 1,200 Grenadian militia, and we're going to go fly into this, to this compound and kill everybody. OK, so I'm doing the math. There's 15 guys in the first platoon. I'm like, OK. It was very clear we were all certain that this was not going to be as easy as the other missions had been despite being outnumbered the troops have faith in each other and their state-of-the-art choppers we loaded up all the rangers we took off together uh, we swung out to the south of the island we were going to be the last aircraft we were going to be eight out of eight 
Black Hawk number one approaches the target and lands safely. Once again, medic and ranger Steve Trujillo is front and center. I remember it very clearly. Uh, when I left the helicopter, I remember taking fire, the bird was taking hits, and I remember I ran for cover. Someone is shooting at us. I can't see where they are, and I'm looking. A nightmare is about to unfold. In the chaos, something goes wrong. Very wrong. And then I look back as I hear something, and I see all the other birds crashing behind me. In a matter of seconds, the number two, three, and four Blackhawks all go down. I could actually feel the tremors. I could feel them in the hand grips of my weapon when the rotors were hitting the, hitting the ground. As soon as uh, we cleared the cliff, I could see uh, three aircraft um, laying over on their sides. Uh, rotor blades were spinning, uh, were winding down. Uh, parts of the uh, tail boom of one, I think, was torn off. It all happened so quickly that until we saw it, we had no, no indication that this had happened. The crash site is ghastly. There were just bodies. Fortunately, there are survivors as well. The team leader issues an urgent order. Help the men in the helicopters. And I'll never forget it. He said, Doc, go back there. They need you. And I swore, I swore at this guy. This is the indoctrination. When you're told, take that hill, you go. When you're told, hit that door, you hit that door. You do it, you don't question, you react. What started as an assault mission has suddenly turned into a rescue mission. Now, the Rangers need to save their own. Three Black Hawk helicopters have crashed in a remote part of Grenada. Medic Steve Trujillo, who witnessed the ghastly crash, is among the first on the scene. First thing I was registering on was body parts. I looked inside the bird, and uh, it was pretty gruesome inside. You can't tell how many guys you have, okay? You don't know, because you're just seeing body parts. You're seeing chunks of flesh. A lieutenant's leg hangs by a thread. He was pushing backwards to get back. And I remember seeing his stump just stick straight up. I'm looking at him thinking, man, you're going to die. His veins are deflated. I banged that, that catheter in first try, first shot. And that's your first IV going, just like that. The lieutenant does survive. But four men are dead, and two others seriously injured. They are evacuated on the remaining Black Hawk helicopters. At this point, no one on the mission has any idea what caused the disaster. As we started to head back to the, uh, to the airfield, still thinking that the first group was shot down, some point between the barracks and the airfield colonel was overhead, battalion commander, uh, and he called in and he said, but slow down, caveman, you lost three aircraft because you went in too hot. The power and speed of the Blackhawks had gotten out of control. The first group probably went in a little too fast. Human error, compounded by enemy fire, is the cause of the chopper crashes. The first aircraft landed all right, the second aircraft landed all right, and then the uh, third aircraft overshot uh, his landing, uh, meshed rotor blades with the second aircraft, which caused both aircraft to flop over on the other side. I felt like I'd fallen down a mine shaft, you know. Operation Urgent Fury, riddled with problems from the very start, now has three more helicopters in charred pieces. 
and more than a dozen men dead. And there are still some 200 students to be rescued. It got a little grim. People who, you know, are normally motivated and brave. You saw a lot of white faces and you saw a lot of people like, hmm, this isn't good. One of the pilots came up to me, tapping his pack, pack of cigarettes again. I said, oh, Jay, I don't smoke, I don't smoke, I don't smoke. So he came up again, he goes, oh, that's right, you don't smoke. And, and I remember I looked at him, I said, today's a good day to learn. Despite the enormous tragedy, the Rangers must quickly regroup and swing back into action. And they do. Over the next two days, U.S. troops quickly sweep and secure the entire island. With the mission nearly complete, there is only one objective left. Rescuing the remaining medical students living off campus on the island. God knows what had happened if they didn't come and rescue us. Uh, maybe some of us would have been killed. Who knows what had happened? Compounding the rescuer's difficulty, the students are scattered in houses throughout Grenada. Finding them won't be easy. But with a dedicated sense of purpose, every last student is tracked down and led to safety. That was one of the purposes of the mission. And uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that no students were injured or were killed was a very important factor. The main objectives of Operation Urgent Fury are now met. American students are evacuated, and a communist back threat in the Caribbean is crushed. Major action ends on October 29, 1983. It was successful. I came back alive. We brought all our, all our boys home because we never left the Ranger behind. And I look back at that as a, as a good thing. Today in Grenada, at the campus of St. George's University, there is a small bronze monument. It honors the troops who rescued the students and restored order to the island. 